So thank you for the opportunity to present my work with Helen Milner. My name is Alex Gasmerarian, and I'm a second year PhD student studying the political economy of climate change. And the question that motivates our project is why do some countries, cities, firms, and individuals curtail emissions that cause climate change while others continue to pollute? And the prominent explanations of collective action in distributed politics assume that all actors incur costs from global warming, some more so than others. But this is inconsistent with considerable research that finds higher temperatures have heterogeneous effects with the potential for net benefits in certain areas. And while the aggregate damage from climate change is negative and warrants swift and immediate action, it's likely that actors will take a self-interested rather than global perspective. And given these incentives, we amend the standard distributed politics model to account for potential net benefits from higher temperatures. We do so by deriving preferences from a dynamic economic assessment model, and we theorize that as actors update their beliefs about climate change, whether they stop polluting depends on if they benefit or lose from global warming. We test our theory by examining the climate actions taken by 144 countries in over 42,000 cities. We validate our information updating mechanism with two cross-national surveys, and we directly model collective action dynamics with a Bayesian spatial model. Now, in contrast to the standard distributed politics model, we find that climate damages and benefits increasingly dominate decisions to reduce emissions, not incumbent group interests. And in contrast to the collective action theory, we find that while free riding was once salient, it's decreasing as actors update beliefs about climate damages. The results suggest that a new political cleavage is emerging between the global north and south, which face bimodal benefits and costs. And this political cleavage will cause existing patterns of bargaining that we observe to reverse as the damages from climate change accelerate. Now, prevailing theories of why actors reduce emissions assume that all face damages from climate change. The collective action theory argues that emissions reductions are a global public good, and the failure to reduce emissions is due to free riding. However, if some actors benefit from global warming, their pollution is not evidence of free riding, but the consequence of higher temperature ideal points. Now, the standard distributed politics model argues that emissions reductions are the product of political contestation between politicians, interest groups, and citizens, and it's assumed that actors outside of the energy sector support emissions reductions because of the climate hazards they face. But we observe considerable variation in support for climate policy among these actors, suggesting that there are unmodeled dimensions of their preferences. In contrast, our theory amends the standard distributive model to account for potential damages and benefits from higher temperatures. Our theory builds on an established climate econometrics literature that finds potential benefits that are localized from global warming for high latitude countries in terms of GDP, amenities and productivities, agricultural yields, energy consumption, and human mortality. Even hazards like sea level rise redistribute economic activity inland, creating new economic centers that gain. Now for our theory, we deploy a dynamic economic assessment model of global warming from Cruz and Rosie Hansberg. This model quantifies the effects of global warming on local productivities and amenities at a granular resolution, one by one cells with over 17,000 cells across the globe. And productivities refer to the efficiency of economic activity in a location, and amenities are features that make a place desirable to live, like health, governance, and education. And the model incorporates how actors will respond to climate change, adapting through trade, migration, and innovation. And what you see here in the map is the effect of global warming on fundamental amenities and productivities over the next century. And the bimodal distribution of benefits and damages is striking. The global north experiences potential benefits while the south incurs large costs. And our use of the global north and global south largely maps onto how it's historically been used, but places like Australia within our model also experience damages when we considered part of the south. Now, the bimodal distribution of the benefits and damages emerges for two reasons. First is that the effect of temperature on productivity and amenities depends on baseline temperatures. An increase in temperatures in places that are presently cool may enhance productivity and amenities to a limit, while the very same increase in a place that is presently hot causes damages. The second reason is that as people migrate and adapt in response to higher temperatures, economic centers will shift inland and northwards which leads to agglomeration and changes incentives to invest in local technology, both of which increase economic growth. 
Now we use these heterogeneous effects from the model to amend the standard distributive politics framework. Each actor, be it a country, a city, or a firm, confronts potential damages or benefits from global warming, depending on its location. However, these potential damages and benefits only become salient as actors update their beliefs in response to observed climate change. So an actor that's in a presently cool place in response to heat anomalies observed climate change will increasingly understand that it benefits from higher temperatures, which we see in the context of Russian towns that are undergoing economic revivals as more land for agriculture expands and shipping lanes also open up. In contrast, actors in presently hot places that experience the very same heat anomaly will become increasingly convinced that they face damages from global warming, as we see in coastal cities in Brazil. Now all else equal, actors that face potential benefits will continue polluting as they update their beliefs about climate change, whereas those facing potential damages will mitigate emissions. And this occurs through two, at least two mechanisms. Um, first is for individuals impacted by climate change, they'll change whether they vote or not um, for politicians that support climate policy or oppose it. And for firms that might benefit, such as agriculture in Canada, they may lobby against climate policy or increasingly do so as they realize the benefits of higher temperatures. While as agriculture in areas that are climate vulnerable, such as Central America, will lobby for climate carbon mitigation. Now we test our theory at the country level first, and the outcome measure here is the stock of climate mitigation laws measured by the climate change laws of the world data from Grantham. And what's striking in the marginal effects plot is that as countries experience more heat anomalies, which we measure by satellite data and display on the Y, the X axis, they're significantly more likely to enact climate policies if they face potential damages, but not if they face potential benefits. And importantly, this effect holds when accounting for the size of the fossil fuel economy, which suggests that the standard distributive politics concerns of incumbent interest groups are less salient than the damages and benefits that actors might face from higher temperatures. Next, we test our theory at the city level with a hierarchical model. Cities are important because they account for roughly two thirds of global emissions and they're increasingly taking steps to combat climate change. Now the outcome measure here is if a city reports taking action on climate change to CDP, the carbon disclosure project, and cities have an incentive to report because it provides access to networks of information and sends a credible signal to sustainability minded investors. And just as we found with countries, in response to heat anomalies, Cities are more likely to report taking action on climate change if they face damages, but not potential benefits. And in this model specification, we measure the size of fossil fuel interests using satellite data on sectoral air pollution. And here, as we did at the country level, we find mixed evidence for the standard distributive politics model while our results hold in, across different specifications. Now to evaluate this information updating mechanism, we examine two cross-national surveys with questions about global warming concern as the outcome measure. The first survey on the left shows that respondents express greater concern about climate change as they experience more heat anomalies if they face potential damages, but not if they face potential benefits. Now, the survey on the right is taken in 2019, whereas the one on the left is fielded between 2005 and 2009. And in the survey that's more recent is taken when individuals have stronger priors about global warming. And you can see that the effect weakens due to more weight being placed on the prior, but it still obtains when measuring climate damages in terms of amenities, which is expected because these are easily observed and understood by individuals. Now, to test the collective action theory, we estimate a Bayesian spatial model that accounts for the interdependence of actors. The y-axis is the spatial dependence parameter rho, which measures the correlation of countries' climate policies. And based off of how we measure distance, a negative row suggests that there is free riding and that reciprocity is ineffective at solving the collective action problem. And what's striking is that while free riding was once salient, it declines over time, which we attribute to growing awareness of climate damages and benefits, which alter the payoffs of actors. Now we conclude with our contributions. Our paper amends the standard distributive politics model to account for heterogeneity and global warming's damages and benefits. This leads to novel predictions that we validated with evidence from countries, cities, and individuals. First is that the physical effects of global warming increasingly dominate distributive conflict, not incumbent group interests. Across all empirical models, the damage from climate change is more consistent in explaining climate action than measures of fossil fuel influence. 
The apparent success of interest groups in the global north may be more so due to the lower vulnerability of these places, which minimizes public pressure for climate mitigation, not the interest group's tactics. Second is that free riding is receding. Our models indicate that as awareness of climate change's physical effects increases, countries are more likely to reduce emissions irrespective of the actions of others. Now this differs from the standard distributive politics account that says free riding is not necessary to explain variation in climate policy. Our results show that free riding was once salient, but is much less so because of changing perceptions of global warming's costs and benefits. Now third, and importantly, a new political cleavage is forming between actors in the global north and those in the global south. The bimodal distribution of damages and benefits suggests that the north and south will have diametrically opposed preferences. And while we typically think of the north as having to encourage the south to cut its emissions, our dynamic theory suggests that the tables will turn as climate damages manifest disproportionately in the south. And while we see the south demanding compensation from the north for climate change, we cannot infer preferences from this observed outcome which reflects strategic incentives. And some of the recent events at Glasgow are suggesting that countries like India are increasingly realizing that they need to act on climate change. And time will tell how credible commitments like their net zero in 2070 commitment will be, but this is indicative of a broader shift of actors in the global South increasingly taking action on climate change, irrespective of the actions of those in the North. Fourth is that we provide a workhorse model of preferences for future research. Previous work has acknowledged the importance of climate damages, but has lacked a parsimonious model to generate predictions as to which actors are vulnerable. We provide a tractable model that can scale across different levels of analysis and be used to tackle new puzzles. And in doing so, we integrate climate econometrics research with political science. Uh, thank you for your time, and we look forward to your questions.